Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege of gathering together, either physically in this room or by Zoom, to link our minds and our hearts and our lives together, to seek you and your will, to hear your word, to pray one for another, and to spend time with you and our brothers and sisters in Christ. Please bless us and grant that we may be spiritually renewed and refreshed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians, chapter 1, Philippians, the first chapter. While you're turning there, I just a few preliminary comments. I love the book of Philippians. Um, it is one of, if not the most, personal tender epistles that Paul ever wrote. Uh, he did not have a bad word for the church. Now, he did in the, uh, what, the uh, uh, fourth chapter uh, call out two women in the church. And by the way, uh, Paul must have been a very brave man to call out two women in the church to say, you got a problem, straighten up. Um, but other than that, there's not a negative tone in the book. And in addition to that, the book is just saturated with joy, the joy that Paul had in Christ and the love that he felt for these Philippian Christians. But in the first chapter of Philippians, he talks about his personal circumstances. You need to know that this epistle uh, is, is in the category of the prison epistles. Uh, there were several Paul's uh, prison epistles. Uh, that is to say, he wrote these epistles while in prison. And this is one of his prison epistles. And he refers to his imprisonment. Uh, and I'd like to read for you verses 12 through 14 of chapter 1, chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, and verse 18. Um, and then I'd like to share with you on the title, Trials Advancing the Gospel. Trials Advancing the Gospel. Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. Let me pause and say, if you have the New American Standard Bible, uh, that, that is translated instead of imperial guard, the praetorian guard, and your translation may have that. I'm reading the ESV, which translates that the whole praetorian or the whole imperial guard. Continuing verse 13, and to the rest. Now, could I pause and say, I wish Paul had been a little more clear there. The rest of what? <laughs> the rest of who? Uh, we, we don't know. I, I have a thought on that, but uh, he just says, and to the rest. End of verse 13 that my imprisonment is for Christ. Verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, let me just work with that a moment. I think what he is saying here is there is something about Paul's imprisonment that gave the brothers and sisters in Christ outside of prison in the town courage to be bold with the gospel. Was that because of how Paul uh, responded to his imprisonment? Uh, and they saw how Paul acted in there. He was bold. He was courageous. He was testifying of Christ, and it gave them courage. And they and they they thought, well, if Paul can do that in prison, we can surely do that out of prison. Or was it the way God worked in Paul's imprisonment? I'm not sure, but I think those are the best 
options for how we're to understand that. Nonetheless, Paul's imprisonment encouraged other Christians to be bold for Christ. Mm. And then verse 18. Now, but in verses 15 through 17, he will say the preaching of the gospel was, was intensified with Paul being in prison in two ways. We've already talked about one. There were brothers and sisters in Christ preaching Christ because Paul was in prison. Something about his imprisonment helped them to be bold. Number two, a very remarkable thing that he said is that uh, there were those uh, who preached Christ in hopes that their preaching Christ outside of prison would cause Paul more trouble in prison. What's with that? But he, he talks about that, that there were some who actually preached Christ in hopes to cause Paul more trouble in prison. They didn't like him. And then this is what he said in verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Now, you know me, I would never want to correct the Apostle Paul. Far be it from me to say anything about the Apostle Paul. But it causes me to wonder, was he really rejoicing that some pretended to preach Christ? I think what Paul is saying here is his desire is that Christ be preached no matter what. That was just his passion in this life. That's my expositional handling of, of the text. However, the main point is well taken. Paul was in prison. Paul was testifying of Christ in prison. And, and good things were happening because Paul was doing that. I have four points to make tonight that I hope will be helpful uh, to you that I will draw from the passage actually in what it says and that which it implies. Number one, our life experiences can, and I should add, and should become the means by which we are able to share Christ. Let me read that again. Our life experiences can and should become the means by which we are able to share Christ. Uh, I'm sometimes asked about an evangelistic program in the church, and my response will always include the following. One of the best evangelistic programs in the church is when the people of the church try to share Christ through their lives with other people. It's just a natural thing that when it comes up, I'm not going to tell you the story, but I had a big problem this week with my house. We'll leave it at that. And, uh, and the guy who was in charge of the construction crew, they're trying to help me, called me, and we were talking about how long my, last will, my house will last. Oh, man, am I really building it up? And then I, I saw my opportunity and I said, you know what? His name is Ron. And I said, Ron, I don't think I'll be here in that X number of years. And I said, Ron, I'm going to a better place. It got quiet on the phone. That was the entry point to talk about death and life. We were talking about my house. And now we're talking about death and eternity. Do you see how that works? You, you, just, you just talk about things that matter when you have an opportunity to talk about things that matter. That's the best evangelistic program that a church could ever, ever have. The point is, our life experiences can become the platform from which we launch into discussing things that are spiritual in nature. Number two. Number two is a subset of number one. Okay, so here's number two. Our trials in life 
are special moments when we can become conveyors of the gospel to others. Let me say that again. Our trials in this life are special moments when we become or can become conveyors of the gospel to others. Yes, our whole life can be a means by which we share Jesus. But when we have problems, when we get sick, when things go wrong, this is a special time. This is a specific time when we have an opportunity to talk about Christ to other people. John Piper, after he had cancer, after he was diagnosed with cancer, wrote a little book entitled, Don't Waste Your Cancer. And the thesis of that book was, use, use your cancer as an opportunity to speak to others, whether you're going for treatment or you're going for surgery or you're in a cancer support group or whatever it may be, use your content text of life. They relate to you as a cancer patient. Use that as an opportunity to speak to people about vulnerabilities, about illness, about your dependency upon God, about your need for Christ, and about God's supply of grace in your life. This is a great opportunity. I've told this story before. I'll tell it again. I was on my way to a certain place. I think it was to preach, which makes it all the worse. And I was in a hurry. I think I was late. It was my fault. And I was out of gas. And I hurriedly drove in to uh, the gas station and I couldn't pay at the pump. So I, I paid inside and I hurried in and, and I was in a line and you know how this works. And I was flustered and I got up to pay for my gas. And the person at the counter said, are you having a problem today? And I said, yes, I'm, in, I'm late and all that. And they said to me, you know, since I've become a Christian, I don't get as frustrated as I think you are. And I stood there more frustrated because here I'm going to preach and I am not giving a good witness of my faith in Christ. I took that as a rebuke from God. Well taken. Your, your problems, whatever they may be, small or large, can become an opportunity to look for a chance to speak of things that matter. And by the way, I think people watch you more when you're having problems than they normally do. Number three, this should help us think about life and our life experiences in the context of the gospel. This should help us think about life and our life experiences in the context of the gospel. And I want to be clear. I want to say this. I want to make sure I say this. It is not wrong to acknowledge your problems. <laughs> okay. Don't, don't pretend like... Um, and I have met people like this who refuse to say they were sick and they're coughing and hacking and they're, no, I'm not sick. <laughs> You're sick. Go home. It's okay to admit it. Um, and there are those who hold to theological falsehoods that believe that if they never confess they're sick, they're really not sick. And it's, that's just goofy, isn't it? I'm not sure how that works. It's okay to say, I've got a problem. But my point is, the problem shouldn't be the dominant feature of your life when you have a problem. Surgery shouldn't be the dominant feature. Problems that we encounter in this life, difficult though they may be, are just the, the circumstantial context in which we're living. I really don't think we should think of ourselves as as um, as created or or I should say colored by our problems. We are Christians going through a hard time. And that should change how we view that. Number four, making Christ known and Christ being made known 
in this world is our highest goal in life. Now, I'm making a leap here to number four. Making Christ known and Christ being made known is our highest goal in life. By the way, how does that translate to parenting? How do you translate that to your children? When you talk to your children about life and what's important in life, how, how do we as parents say to them, our being able to make Christ known in and through our lifetime is what it looks like for a, a, a life to be successful. Not rich, not being famous, not having power, but making Christ known. And I, have, I just have flashbacks in my mind of how many people I have known and heard of their testimonies that they, God has called them to a foreign shore to serve Christ in another context, in another culture, in another nation. And they would say, when asked, why are you going? What are you going to do? They would say something like this. I want to make Christ known. But that's not just for those who go there, to places like that. That's for, go, for people who go here to work. And go to school. How can I make Christ known? I think, but let, let me say a comment about trials. I think one of the best things we can say to people in our response to our problems and trials is that Christ is enough. Christ satisfies us. We don't need any more than what we have in him. And by the way, later in this chapter, in Philippians 1, he's going to say things like, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And, and what does he say? I long to depart and be with Christ. So for Paul, in Philippians 1, his whole life comes down to Christ. If I'm alive, Christ, if I die, it doesn't matter. Boy, that sounds so spiritual, doesn't it? Is that for you and for me? Or is that just for Paul? Conclusion. When trials come, and they will come, we have a deliberate choice to make. What we choose to do in the hour of our hardship is the critical component of our lives. Will we be overcome by our trials or will we choose to seek the Lord's will, seek the Lord's mercy, seek to show others that he is enough, that our joy is not in our health, our joy is in Christ. What we choose to do in the hour of our trials says so much about us. It says so much about our faith. It says so much about where we are with Jesus. I don't say this to bring condemnation upon us. It is hard to be sick. We struggle when we're sick, when we lose a job, when we're fired from our job, when they disband our department and we can no longer make a living there. It's hard. It's okay to say it's hard. But don't give in to it. Look for an opportunity to show Christ strong in your life. Are we willing to take that challenge upon ourselves? I hope and pray that we will. With that in mind, I want to say a final word as I lead us into prayer. I would like to suggest two things. One, that we pray for each other. I just want to ask you a question. Do you pray for the people in this room? Maybe not all of them. <laughs> A lot of them. Do they come to mind ever, ever? And I, I say that as a challenge to you and to me. I count it a privilege to pray for my people. And I think that's a calling. It's a stewardship. It's a responsibility for a pastor, but also for each of you. And the second thing is this. When you pray for each other, pray that we will endure well that we won't be overcome by our challenges and trials. 
but that we'll be faithful and that we'll be a conduit of truth to other people when we have opportunity, okay? Let's pray that that will happen now together. Heavenly Father, I pray that for my people. I pray that for myself. I am so prone. I am so prone to giving in when an unexpected thing happens. Particularly if it's an unexpected negative thing. My first response usually is not, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share you. Um, but I pray in my life and in the lives of my brothers and sisters that as we engage life at these difficult things, that you'll show us how to walk with Jesus and share with others the joy that we have in Jesus in spite of our problems, even in our problems. That is a miracle of your grace for that to happen. I pray it will in our lives and that you will use these times to bring life to others through an understanding of the truth. In Christ's name we pray.